We are very pleased to uh, see you all here today. A very rainy day, I know. A little bit of spring in the air, thankfully. A little warmer than it's been. And uh, I know that it may have taken a little extra time for folks to get in today, but still the room is nearly full, and, and I think that we'll be seeing most of the seats go over the course of the, uh, of the next few minutes. If, uh, because we know that seating is limited and registration is high, if uh, you see, you know, during uh, Professor Shoup's speech, if you see people wandering in and kind of think they're looking for a chair and you have a spare place at your table, please just raise your hand in their direction. And I promise you, uh, Professor Shoup will not call on you uh, for a question at that point in time, but you'll help to bring people in. Thank you. Why is parking important? Well, we have a few reasons at MAPC that I'd like to mention, then I'd like to close with one. One is that high parking requirements directly increase the cost of building new housing, which is a major objective for MAPC and a major objective for the Commonwealth, as evidenced by the governor's 10,000 multifamily units a year goal that he established now about a year and a half, two years ago, I believe. Recent analysis that we've conducted by MAPC show that about two-thirds of the cities and towns in our region have a minimum residential parking requirement that is higher than the average car ownership per household in that community. At twenty dollars to $100,000 per space, parking requirements have a huge impact on the cost of housing, especially when they are unnecessary. Inflexible parking requirements can stunt economic development and encourage sprawl. We have many walkable historic town centers, yet many municipalities in our region require on-site parking for all new development, essentially indicating that there is no way to duplicate the wonderful town centers that all of those communities prize. Abundant free parking encourages and subsidizes driving. Massachusetts, as many of you know, has an ambitious goal of tripling the number of trips made by walking, biking, and transit by the year 2030, which does not look as far away as it did when we adopted our Metro Future Plan about six years ago. We will never reach this goal as long as the cost of driving is hidden from people making day-to-day -day transportation choices. I've been involved in city planning in the Metro Boston region now for most of my career, about 30 years. And in that time, I've had the opportunity to sit at the back of the room, sometimes at the front of the room, during many discussions about individual developments that are being planned. And I've always noticed, and the same is true today, that the discussion of parking has an outsized part of those conversations before a development actually gets into the ground. They talk about it more than the financing. They talk about it more than the affordability of the units. They often talk about it more than the design. Yet with all that time and all that effort and all the requirements, I've noticed that when it's finally finished, most people are actually dissatisfied with the parking. Some people think there's too much. Most people, for reasons that escape my understanding, think there's too little. Some people don't like what it looks like when it's a when it's all asphalt. Some people don't like what it looks like when it's a large parking structure. Some people think there's never enough parking at the development, and some people point out that it's empty 90% of the time. So if we talk about it and we work on it so hard, but most people aren't satisfied with the results, maybe we need to push those old ideas aside and really think of new ways to deal with the parking issue here in the Boston region, throughout the Commonwealth, and throughout America. We are very pleased to have with us the nation's great expert on new ways of thinking about parking, Professor Donald Shoup, the distinguished professor of urban planning from UCLA. And I'll tell you a little bit more about him in a moment, but I'd like to start by thanking some of the people who have made this conference possible. First of all, on my own staff, uh, the chief planner for uh, this conference uh, and uh, uh, really the person who kept us all working, everybody working step by step to try and make sure that we would get to this day, a uh, member of our transportation planning staff, Jessica Roberts, and I'd like you all to acknowledge her, if you could. <laughs> and standing behind Jessica also, our director of transportation, uh, Eric Barassa, who has played a big role in putting this conference together. 
We definitely couldn't have done this without financial and programmatic support from a number of other entities, but I'm going to mention three particularly. The first is the, the firm of Nelson Nygaard, obviously no stranger to these issues. Jason Schreiber and Lisa Jacobson, who are both here today, I'd like them to be acknowledged. Jason, and where is Lisa? She's somewhere, probably out front still. We are very pleased to have a close working relationship on so much of the work that we do at MAPC with the Department of Housing and Community Development, uh, the state's chief agency dealing with those issues. Uh, I know that uh, under the leadership of Aaron Gornstein, who I think is not here right now but may be here later in the day, uh, DHCD fully recognizes that the issue of parking is a critical issue to deal with. Uh, for housing, community development, and economic development. They don't divorce those things from one another, and that's definitely due to Aaron's leadership and understanding. I'd like to very much thank some people who have been involved from DHCD, particularly those who have worked heavily on the conference, Bill Ryle, who I know is sit standing uh, right out there by the door, and also particularly Emmy Hahn, who was at the front desk. I don't know if she's in here yet, but uh, let's thank them very much, please. And last but not least, by any means, I want to thank Elaine Weina, uh, Elaine Weina from the Massachusetts chapter of the American Planning Association, also a co-sponsor and a partner of ours in this event. For all of those who have worked so hard in the event, I'd like to acknowledge and thank them, please. <laughs> now, Jessica has provided me with a paragraph regarding Twitter. I know nothing about this subject, but... Uh, I don't feel I can paraphrase the remarks. I think I have to state them specifically. So I'm going to read what Jessica has written here on this topic. Questions can be submitted either by writing on the index card in your folder or via Twitter using the hashtag SparkingIdeas. The index cards will be collected at the end of Professor Shoup's address. And Jessica, I presume some of those questions will actually be asked. Is that right? They won't just be collected. So the professor will have the opportunity to answer them the old-fashioned way. Okay. So as I indicated, Donald Shoup is Distinguished Professor of Urban Planning at UCLA. He is the author of the seminal book, which many of you are familiar with and probably brought you here, The High Cost of Free Parking, which provided the blueprint for a revolution in the way we think about parking in the urban planning context. His work has focused on the history of parking policies in the United States and how they have distorted both transportation and land use with enormous consequences for cities, the environment, public health, and the economy. He has authored more than 100 articles published in the popular and scholarly press and inspired such a devoted following that those who have taken up his call for parking reform have, reform have been dubbed Shupistas. He has even been called a parking rock star and the Yoda of urban planning by no less distinguished a, a source than the Wall Street Journal. Uh, we are very pleased that he has traveled so far to be with us here today and to bring his message and his ideas to spark our own. It is my pleasure to present to all of you Professor Donald Shoup. It's an honor to be here among such a distinguished group of parking consultants and, and parking experts. Uh, um, you may remember from your college days that, uh, that professors come in two types. Um, I don't mean the liberals and the conservatives or the men and the women. Uh, I mean the cats and the dogs. Uh, the dogs run around in packs and, and they uh, bark a lot and each one tries to become the top dog. But the cats are solitary. Uh, they like to mark territory as their own so the other cats will stay out. Uh, and among the professors of transportation planning, all the dogs chase after moving cars, you know, trying to bite the tires. Or, or they ride around in cars with their heads out the windows, excited by speed. Um, well, the cats don't like riding around in cars. They never hang their heads out, out the window. Uh, instead, they inspect all the parked cars, and they mark the tires. Um, uh, 
cats also enjoy sleeping on the hood of a newly parked car while the engine is still warm. And they use this time to brood about the economics of parked cars. Uh, <laughs> Well, cars are parked 95% of the time, as your cars are right now. Um, so, well, all the dogs are chasing after cars uh, during the 5% of the time that they're moving. I thought I could find out something about the 95% of the time that cars are parked. Uh, I thought it was this is an important time. After all, at an audience this large, some of you were probably even conceived in a parked car. Um, <laughs> I was pleased to learn that I was called a parking rock star, uh, but I realized that's not the same thing as a real rock star. Uh, although I am thinking of changing my name to Shoop Dog. Um, uh, and I was also pleased to be called the Yoda of urban planning until I remember that Yoda was 800 years old. Um, um, well, it's, it's embarrassing for a Californian to be invited to speak in Boston about t telling you what to do about parking or driving or anything like that because most people think that uh, we've paved over the entire state for parking. Uh, and, and we have paved over a large part of it. Here's a view of, uh, of Silicon Valley. Um, and I think we tend to ignore this asphalt blight in our lives, especially when we're parked free in it, as all of these cars are, uh, on a weekday afternoon. Um, but parking is free to us only in our role as motorists. Uh, and we pay dearly for this parking in every other aspect of our lives, as a, as a uh, employer, as a worker, as a taxpayer, as an investor, as a consumer, as a resident, as a tenant. Um, the cost of parking doesn't cease to exist just because the driver doesn't pay for it. Uh, the cost is still there, and it has to be paid by somebody, and that somebody is everybody, including people who are too poor to own a car. Um, here's a, a bigger view of this area. This is the Cisco campus. This is what we call a campus in California. Um, uh, and I think that it's uh, a bad parking policy uh, and, and, and no parking technology. That the, there's nobody making any money out of this parking. Uh, that there's no, all the, the uh, wonderful display of, of technology that you have here in the lobby, none of that is being used here. Um, it's just all free. Uh, but you do have some of that here, in, even in Boston, uh, one of the most civilized cities in, in the United States, here's, I guess, it says it's the University of Massachusetts at Bayside. Does anybody park there? And here's the Boston Convention Center. That looks like it has a lot of surface parking. And even some of the suburban areas have a lot of parking. Um, but I, I think these aerial views sometimes give an unflattering, unfair picture of what's on the ground. Here's what it looks like on the ground. <laughs> Well, I think that, that, that my profession, the urban planning profession, is responsible for a lot of this uh, because cities require this parking. Um, and where do they know how much to require? Well, they go to the American Planning Association. Here's a book, Parking Standards. Who could object to that? Standards sound like a good idea. High standards, uh, who could object to that? Uh, 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 but this book says nothing about standards. Uh, it just reports the parking requirements in, in dozens of cities. You, if you want to know what the parking requirement for an animal grooming studio would be, uh, because the city council of Boston has asked you to set it, well, what would you do? You've never learned anything in your planning education on how to set a parking requirement. Um, well, you go, go and look and see, well, what does... Uh, what does New Haven require? And what does uh, uh, other cities require for an animal grooming study? After all, it passed the city council. It must have some basis. Uh, and that's how these uh, uh, parking requirements are spread. Here's a, just a picture of the um, land uses. You probably can't read that. It's not important. It's eight pages of land uses. This just gets you from abattoir up to boarding house on the lower right. Uh, and planners have to set parking requirements for all of these things. 
uh, one of the signs of the boom in, during the Clinton years was the, the great increase in the number of, uh, of, of land uses for parking requirements. It went from one parking requirement for adult use to 10 different kinds of adult use, like uh, uh, adult bookstore, adult massage parlor, adult theater. And planners have to know the different parking demands at each one of those things. Uh, now here's a picture of the adult use thing. And that shows, this is from the American Planning Association. Is this what they want our world to look like? The pictures they choose say something about the planning we do. And each one of these uh, parking requirements seems sensible, taken by itself. If you look at them one by one, they make sense, uh, especially if you can relate it to the number of people. It's often related to people, and they always require at least one parking space uh, per person. Although there are gender distinctions that are hard to explain. Uh, well, I, I should say they require one parking space for every person except for religious land uses, and even then there's a di gender distinction. <laughs> but once you get away from the number of people where you, it's not so obvious what it is, then we go per thousand square feet, uh, which is the way most parking requirements are set. Uh, but then there's some that don't lend themselves to that, and you have to uh, get more inventive. Uh, that if the city council says what should be the parking requirement for a gas station, well, what would you do? How would you set it? Uh, what what would you base it on? Uh, and the you know the land uses are just hundreds of different land uses, uh, and there's a parking requirements for the afterlife. You have to know all of these things. Um, uh, Cambridge is famous throughout the, the, the country for its uh, progressive parking policies. It has low parking requirements, and it has a typical kind of preening about what we're doing uh, about parking. We want to uh, meet the reasonable needs of all building and land users without establishing regulations which unnecessarily encourage automobile uses. I suppose they want to necessarily encourage. And what does the unnecessarily mean in that sentence? Uh, they would like to have lots of free parking and not have it encourage <laughs> automobile use. Well, you can't have it both ways. And then when you look at Cambridge's parking requirements, the, 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 they really suggest that different parts of the country have different land uses. Say, I would never, I've never seen this in, in California. Umbrellas, parasols, and canes. <laughs> that we have to have a, a parking requirement if somebody wants to open up uh, 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 a shop for umbrellas, parasols, and canes. I mean, we have lots of things for cosmetic studios and things like that in Los Angeles, but not for umbrellas, parasols, and canes. And how did the people in Cambridge know that was the right parking requirement? Well, I think we, uh, Cambridge makes fewer mistakes than, than many cities, but uh, I think most cities make two big, big mistakes. They keep per curb parking free or cheap. Uh, and in order to uh, 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 deal with the problems caused by that, they require lots of off street parking. Um, and I showed you initially these aerial views of Silicon Valley, which is in the city of San Jose. If you look at the San Jose's parking requirements, you can see why Silicon Valley looks like that. Uh, this, uh, the green bar shows the uh, floor area of a building, and the red bar shows the size of the required parking lot. So as these parking requirements create the asphalt jungle, uh, that the city requires the Silicon Valley look like that. Uh, so cities require that parking must be available everywhere uh, anyone wants to go, uh, but they create places that no one wants to be. Uh, and when you look at that, I mean, what a restaurant, that's very common to have 10 spaces per 1,000 square feet, so the, the restaurant is much smaller than the parking lot it sits in. Um, and when you look at the parking requirements in any city, and, and I've just chosen San Jose here, I'll come back to some of yours, they look pretty scientific. Somebody must have really thought this out and done a lot of careful calculations. It looks scientific, but it's not. It's got nothing to do with real science. <laughs> they, they try to make it look scientific. 
And I looked at the parking requirements that, uh, in, in the Boston area, and some of them are, are, are pretty big, uh, that the uh, restaurants usually require a lot of parking. Uh, let me see, I forgot what some of these things, uh, these land uses are, restaurants, and uh, put on my glasses to see that uh, office, Cohasset, and a restaurant in Wellesley. I mean, Wellesley from the West Coast, it sounds like it's sort of a, beautiful academic town, but it looks like they, the parking requirements mean that the, you have a lot more parking than restaurants. And places of worship in Cambridge, look how much they require. The, the, are, are, are the places of worship so popular in Cambridge that the city has to require uh, parking a lot more than three times the size of the building? Or does Cambridge, is it really a secular town that requires a lot of parking so that we won't have any more places of worship? Uh, um, and then Medfield, I, I've never been to Medfield, but when you look at the parking requirements, uh, uh, they're very high. How about constructing a hotel in Medfield, which requires one parking space for each 20 square feet of floor area for land use, for floor area of a meeting? Now, since a parking requirement in parking lots has about three, requires about 330 square feet per parking space, require one parking space for each 20 fair square feet um, means that the parking lot is 16 times bigger than the floor area of the meeting space. And then you also need, what is it, 1.5 parking spaces per room in the hotel and one parking space for each two employees. Now, if you worked for the planning department in Medfield and they asked you to set the parking requirement, what would you have done? Maybe this makes sense, I don't know. And then they require five spaces per doctor. Well, I mean, there's the doctor and then all of us waiting in the waiting room. I suppose we all need a parking space. So here is what it makes downtown. Is this downtown Medfield? Has anybody ever been there? Is that what downtown Medfield looks like? Well, see, it isn't because people wanted it that way. I think it's because the city requires it to be that way. And we have no parking problem there, I'm sure. Well, how much do these parking spaces cost? I just finished doing some research on this. Uh, the planners never consider the cost of parking spaces in setting the parking requirements. That's irrelevant. We just want to know how many parking spaces are needed uh, for anybody who wants to drive a car there. Who cares what the cost is? Um, but uh, how much do parking spaces cost? Well, you can't say because it depends on the site. It depends on the... Uh, the soil conditions, if it's a structure or underground park, it depends on dozens of things. Um, I, I took some estimates of the construction cost per square foot of, uh, in, in different parts of the country by a, a well-known cost estimator um, and uh, looked at it for parking and this shows their estimates for the average cost of parking spaces for an underground garage um, in Boston is uh, $31,000 a space. Now that's the average cost. In some cases it would be much higher, and some could be lower, I suppose. And for an above ground parking space is $25,000 a space. How much does this cost per space, which is never considered, um, compare with the, the, our ability to pay for these required spaces? I'd just like to tap into a current worry that people have, and that is, that we're not saving enough for retirement. Here is the results of a study on savings for retirement. And one structured parking space in Boston costs more than the entire re retirement savings of most American households. Just one space. And we say, these parking spaces are needed. Even though you're, you're, you're forcing uh, investment in parking that exceeds the value of people's retirement. And, and for the, for uh, low-income uh, people, this, this is for all of them. It says, they break it down, of course, we always do it by ethnicity now. It would be those, if you could read the percentages in there, it's uh, over 75% of the retirement savings of the average black household, and over, um, uh, oh, I'm sorry, over 70% of all black households have retirement savings less than $10,000 certainly less than the, the, the cost of one required parking space. And it's even more, 80% uh, of Latinos have saved less than $10,000 for their retirement. So planning is supposed to be about the future, 
but parking requirements are just about satisfying present needs. And the future can take care of itself. Um, so I think that, uh, that these parking requirements are extremely expensive, carelessly set. Uh, uh, problem, because the people who are asked to set the requirements, they don't know how much the required parking spaces cost. Uh, or uh, how much it increased the cost of housing, which was mentioned. I mean, it's, well, how much does it increase the cost of housing? Nobody can tell you. Um, how does it affect urban design? You mentioned that. People complain about the looks of things. How does it affect traffic congestion? How can you set a parking program if you don't know these things or never even thought about them or air pollution? Uh, and fuel consumption, now we have to worry about CO2 emissions. Oh. And the parking uh, uh, instruction in planning schools is zero. Uh, that they, they, that nobody here in any urban planning department, I think, could say that they have any, any instruction in parking requirements. The only way a planning student would hear about parking requirements in planning school is to realize that they interfere with everything they want to do when they graduate with affordable housing or, or um, uh, transit-oriented design or something like that. that. That's the only way they learn about parking requirements, to, to realize that they thwart everything they want to do. And I think we've made a terrible mistake. We have governmentalized what should be a private decision. The government has no business telling anybody how many parking spaces they need because the government doesn't know. Um, and they've created a disaster. So I think the upside of this disaster is that we could, with very small, easy reforms, we can make huge improvements. I think that's the wonderful uh, opportunity we have. I just recommend three simple reforms. And, and the, uh, the, this one is a tautology. How could you object to charging the right price for curb parking? Uh, but by the right price, I mean it's the lowest price the city can charge and still have one or two open spaces on, on every block. Um, sometimes it's called performance pricing or dynamic pricing, although I don't mean that it changes every minute. Um, and then to make this politically popular, cities have uh, established parking benefit districts that spend the meter revenue uh, on, uh, to improve public services on the meter streets. So that if we put meters in your neighborhood, you get all the revenue to pay for putting your wires underground or repairing your sidewalks or facade improvements or um, graffiti removal. And that makes the, the, uh, the, the meters popular because every time you step outside your door, you see the meter money at work. It doesn't disappear into City Hall. In City Hall, you might as well give it to the UN or to the, uh, the war in Iraq or Afghanistan, something like that. The money just has no political benefit. And then once you've done that, you can reduce or remove the parking requirements. Um, and you don't, uh, one thing that, uh, I think many planners don't pay attention to, having parking requirements makes it very difficult to reuse old buildings because if you wanted to convert a shoe store into a restaurant, the first thing the planners would say, well, where's the required parking? That it makes it very difficult to adapt old buildings, um, uh, which are a scarce resource. I mean, you've got plenty of them, but uh, in most cities, they're, they're a very valuable resource and parking requirements makes it hard to use them. Uh, so um, uh, I think that uh, we have uh, these three great opportunities. Uh, the the performance-based parking prices, um, they, they adjust over time. That it means there will be different prices at different times of day uh, to have a few vacant spaces. About 85% occupancy is the rule of thumb that people use. It, I don't mean that literally. but. Sort of an average of 85% is about right. That's about one out of eight spaces is open. So wherever you go, you'll see that, um, uh, that there are one or two open spaces. Nobody can say that there's a shortage of parking. Now, how can anybody say there's a shortage of parking? Wherever they go, they see one or two open spaces. Um, uh, and that's not such a terrible thing. I mean, we've gotten used to the idea of that there is no parking. And I think that's worse than paying for parking. 
San Francisco was trying this, and they, uh, because they had a federal <coughs> grant, they had money for a graphic artist. I think that's, uh, I think any, <laughs> anybody who runs a public agency knows you need a great graphic artist uh, to get across what you want. And here is the, the problem on some blocks that there are, all the spaces are occupied, and people say there's no place to park. Uh, there's a terrific party shortage here. And on other blocks, there are spaces available. So if you just nudge up the price on the top block and nudge it down on the bottom block, you could get something like this. This is what the city should aim for. Um, now, some people think when they first hear about this that, this, that charging fair market prices for curb parking requires some wrenching social change, almost as cataclysmic as the, the Reformation or Prohibition. You know, the Boston couldn't handle this. I mean, we're, we're, we've never done it, and it would be inconceivable here. But it, is it really too much for Boston to move one car from the top block to the bottom block? I mean, can we not handle that? Is it beyond our capabilities? Well, San Francisco is trying it, and they also had money for a nice uh, um, short video that explains in less than three minutes <laughs> everything I'm going to say. You, if you had a choice between watching this video and listening to me, I would watch this video. Finding a parking space can be frustrating and time consuming. It's estimated close to a third of city traffic is caused by drivers circling while looking for a space. Some drivers just give up and double park. This clogs our streets and needlessly pollutes the air. These cars slow down public transit and get in the way of emergency vehicles. And drivers focused on finding parking create a hazard for pedestrians and cyclists. There is a better way. San Francisco is testing new parking technology and a flexible approach to pricing that is designed to make parking work better for everyone. SF Park's goal is to have at least one parking space available per block. That way drivers can park near a specific destination without the need to circle the block or double park. This also provides a steadier flow of customers for business owners. SF Park provides safer and clearer streets for everyone. Here's how it works. Newly installed parking sensors detect when a parking space is available. Drivers will be able to check parking availability and rates online, by text message, and by smartphone before heading to their destination. This will help people decide whether to drive, take public transit, bike, or walk. When people choose to drive, new SF Park meters will make paying easier. In addition to taking coins, the new meters will accept credit cards and SFMTA parking cards. Parking time limits will be extended. Easier payment and extended time limits will help drivers avoid tickets. Prices at city-owned parking garages will be adjusted to provide an attractive alternative to meter parking. Parking rates will be adjusted based on demand, once a month, never by more than 50 cents. So, in areas where it seems nearly impossible to find a parking space, rates will increase until at least one space is available most of the time. And in areas where open parking spaces are plentiful, rates will decrease until most of the empty spaces fill, or until rates bottom out at as little as 25 cents per hour. Uh, well, here's what it looks like uh, over the past two years they've been doing it. You can see that uh, here are two parallel streets um, uh, in, in uh, San Francisco, Chestnut and Lombard. They both started out at the same price, uh, $2 an hour. Uh, Chestnut was over-occupied. That, that gray area in the middle was their target occupancy rate. And uh, uh, the prices started uh, going up on Chestnut and, and declining on Lombard. And it took a while before it had an effect. Uh, but you can see after about a year, Finally, uh, the, the occupancy on Chestnut uh, began to decline, and on Lombard, it, it began to increase. Um, and so the average price, uh, 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 they start out at $2 an hour, and the average price on Lombard fell by 50%, and on Chestnut, it increased by 75%. Uh, and this, this tendency is happening throughout the SF Park uh, area with 7,000 meters. The, the, uh, I guess the, what is the top line is the share of, of parking spaces that are in the right <laughs> occupancy range. And you see, when it started around 40%, it's up at 70%. 
and the over-occupied and under-occupied blocks also declined. And here's a picture of the prices on those two blocks that we were talking about, Lombard and, and Chestnut. Uh, if you can see it, the, the, the prices are dramatically different from one block to the next. It seems inconceivable that it could be 50 cents an hour on one block and 350 an hour a block away. And people say, well, won't that confuse people? And the, the, many journalists call me and ask me about that. I say, well, if the price on Lombard, if the occupancy on Lombard is only half full, do you think the city should not reduce the price? What else can they do? And if they say, well, yes, they should reduce the price, well, it makes sense that if it's all occupied, they should increase it. And that's what they did. And I think that the interesting thing is that on average, the prices declined in San Francisco with this SF Park because most spaces were so overpriced in the morning. You could see uh, whole blocks without a car. There would be a two hour time limit and $2 an hour with no cars at it. So the prices kept going down. Um, uh, and more, more, uh, there were more declines than increases. Here's a, uh, the only nine blocks got up to $6 an hour and 179 had fallen to 25 cents an hour um, uh, because of the over occupancy in the morning. Uh, so I think that, uh, that the, 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 the parking should be free if many spaces uh, remain empty, even at a zero price. Performance pricing doesn't mean high prices. It means the right prices. It means the lowest price you can charge to get the right occupancy. Uh, and you would only get higher prices uh, if prices are so low that there's no place to park. Uh, now, there still was some opposition at the beginning. Uh, here was a sort of a flyer that went on many people's windshields saying it was going to you know, hurt the poor. And of course, on the other side, it's in Spanish. It looks even more dramatic with all the exclamation points. Um, uh, but I think it, it was a coalition to act now, uh, act now to stop war and end racism. racism. Answer coalition. I don't know if you have it here. Act now to stop war and end racism. Well. They, 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 want to, uh, they oppose foreign wars for oil, but they demand free parking at home. There's some inconsistency there. And 30% of San Francisco's households don't own a car. So to think <laughs> that if you have cheap parking is going to help poor people is crazy. To think if you have a certain amount of money to help poor people, giving free parking is not the best way to spend it. That's not the way to help poor people. Um, we only have so much money to give to poor people, and giving it to, for, for free parking for everybody, regardless of their income, is certainly not means testing the subsidy. Um, and then some people say, oh, well, we can't charge for parking in the evening because Oh, people won't be able to afford going out for dinner or something like that. And, and many, many cities stop, uh, turn off their meters in the evening. And I always ask, whenever I go to a restaurant, where did you, the, the waiters, where did you park? I'm shameless about that, but I think that anybody who's interested in parking ought to ask that. And so many times you get the answer, oh, well, I try to get here before 6 and get a meter so I can park free all evening. And that means that there aren't customers who've parked in those spaces. That uh, I think that uh, the, the, the waiters would be a lot better off if they parked farther away and walked, and then the spaces were available for people who are going to give them tips. It reduces employment. It means that there's a lot of cruising for parking right at the rush hour so people can get a metered space. We've all done it. Um, now, some people think that it's hard to do this uh, um, uh, adjustable pricing because the, their meters uh, uh, couldn't handle it. Uh, the, the most meters that I've seen in Boston are functionally identical to the first one in 1935. <laughs> it, is that, uh, here it is, except the 1935 ones are more streamlined, that, that, that they were uh, uh, condemned as an infernal combination of an alarm clock and a slot machine that you just hope to get back before your, your time went out. Uh, but the, the new meters, and there's one of these I see out in the lobby, are much more sophisticated. They can charge different prices at different times of day. They can be adjusted remotely. They can do all kinds of things. Uh, and here's one on the UCLA campus, and it doesn't tell you what the price of parking is. Until you touch a button, any button on the machine, and it tells you the price at that hour. 
Uh, there are four different price uh, periods with different prices, and this one is $3 for the first hour and $4 uh, for the second hour. Well, uh, uh, I set up my camera across from eight spaces uh, monitored by this meter uh, on campus. Uh, some of you were probably sus suspected that professors have a lot of spare time on their hands. <laughs> so I set up my tripod and I just took a picture every four minutes to see what was happening. And you could see, I think in that picture you can see somebody paying at the meter. As it starts out, the two cars in the end never moved. This is just for one hour. You see the shadows moved and I just took a picture uh, every uh, four minutes, and sometimes there was one space available, sometimes two, once three, some, once there was none. But that's roughly what 85% occupancy looks like. And do the parking spaces work that well in your town? Well, every town you come from, could you look at the set, if you set up your camera on a tripod across from eight spaces, would they would they uh, turn over like that? Would, this, would everybody say, oh, well, there's usually a space here. And it's usually always full. That's what it ought to be. Uh, and I just did a bar graph saying, you know, most of the time it was one uh, uh, open space. Uh, sometimes there were two, sometimes three, once there was none. But that's probably as good as you're going to get. And that's on that block. See, if the next block, when there was uh, no open space on, on one block, there may be an open space the next block. It's not catastrophic to have no spaces available for four minutes. <laughs> that's as bad as it gets on this block. Well, is that what it's like in Boston? Well, no. I, here's a cover of a book in, uh, uh, about how awful it is to park in Boston. Um, uh, so what is the right price? Um, uh, should the price at these, this is ch charging for parking on a campus, is it fair to start students $3 for the first hour and 4 for the second? Would well, you think the price should be higher? Well, no, because if it were higher, then more of the spaces would be unused. But if it were lower, there would be no uh, open spaces to where there has to be. Before they started this variable pricing, there would be lines of car waiting up, hoping to see somebody leave. It's just the Goldilocks principle. Not too high, not too low, just right. It's also the Supreme Court like definition of pornography. If the price is right, I know it when I see it. The only way to say whether the price is right is to look at the occupancy. And when I look at the occupancy of those eight spaces, I would say the price was right. And I'd like to hear anybody say they have another way to set prices. I've never heard anybody recommend, well, no, that's not the right way. I'll tell you how to do it. Um, so I think that uh, I'm not saying that $3 an hour is the right price. I'm saying it's the right price in that location at that time, on that day. That's all I'm saying. Um, and I think you need it to avoid uh, cruising for parking, uh, that, uh, that there's a lot of it in Boston. Uh, uh, and in New York, here when I was speaking there, I just took pictures of uh, prices uh, outside the hotel. On street it was a dollar an hour, and off street it was twenty dollars an hour. Um, so if you were going to park for an hour, would you give it a try to see if there was a, you could find somebody moving out uh, rather than pay off street? Um, uh, so well, how does this work in Boston? Um, suppose you uh, want to park... Uh, uh, for one hour, we're visiting City Hall. Um, parking on the street costs a dollar and a quarter. You know that. You can count on that anywhere in Boston. It's a dollar and a quarter. In the government Senate garage, the first hour costs twenty-four dollars. How long would you be willing to drive around hunting for a curb space, hoping to see one being vacated? You'll never see one just empty, but you might see somebody leaving one. So I think the city of Boston is, is uh, uh, telling you to cruise for parking. Uh, now, it doesn't mean that if you charge the right price for curb parking, it would be $24 an hour. I'm saying the only reason is $24 an hour at the beginning, uh, off street, is because there is no curb parking. You see, in San Francisco, they thought it would go through the roof. It never got above $6. Um, uh, so uh, I think... Um, um, uh, Boston has fallen behind uh, in, in its parking uh, pricing. Um, uh, 
uh, as I understand it from the old timers, that the price of parking used to be 25 cents an hour up until 1983, and then they re raised the price to a dollar an hour. Um, and here's what one of the old timers wrote to me about how it changed. Boston, uh, some of you are too young to know, but the old timers know Boston was famous for parking chaos, double parking and triple parking everywhere. It was, it was just lawless. It was, it was, it was, you know, people would come and just, just uh, staggered at the idea that this would be allowed in any city. And raising it to a dollar an hour uh, solved a lot of that problem. And then, and then it just stagnated for a long time. And I, and I understand that um, in 2011, after 10 years of debate at the city council, they raised the price to a dollar and a quarter an hour. Uh, um, <laughs> Uh, everywhere in the city, which is less in real terms than a dollar and a, it's 50% in real terms of what it was in 1983. So the, in real terms, the price of parking has fallen by half in, in Boston. You know, I think that if there's any real force uh, for parking policy in Boston, it must be inertia. Um, and. Um, um, here's just a, 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 maybe you can, those of you who are lucky who are sitting near these screens, but it's a series of studies starting in 1927 on the, uh, uh, how much of the traffic is cruising or how long you have to cruise. Um, and this is on four continents over 80 years and 16 cities, something like that. One of them was in Cambridge. It was an MA thesis by Marianne O'Malley. Isn't that a wonderful Irish Boston name? Marianne O'Malley, who is now a, a, a high uh, official analyst in California. Anyway, she conducted her master's thesis uh, looking at how long it takes to find a, a curb space in Boston. In, in Harvard Square, that's right. Um, and she found that 30% of the cars in the Harvard Square Business District were cruising for parking and it took an average of 11 and a half minutes to find a space. Now, the, the meter price was um, uh, 50 cents an hour and the commercial price of off-street parking was $3. So, of course, if you can pay for parking at 50 cents or $3, well, give it a try. Well, I looked at, 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 at Cambridge. Uh, which is all, as always, preening about his good policy, it's now a dollar an hour, which is less than 50 cents was, in real terms, 30 years ago. And the price of Off Street Park is $8 an hour. So something has gotten worse in Cambridge. The difference between On Street prices and Off Street Park is much higher. Um, uh, so, um, there was a, a, a study done in Chicago before uh, World War II of uh, looking at uh, uh, cruising patterns that they studied following cars. Uh, 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 and it turns out some cars would, on the lower left, would just circle the block, fixate it on one block, and others would be open to new experiences. They <laughs> hope it would be better on the next block. But, but always you think that it's unfair, you know, that, 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 uh, that um, and this leads to very uh, dangerous behavior. I've done a lot of cruising studies myself. You see cars making U-turns in the middle of the street if they see an open space on the other side. This leads to very, very risky behavior. Here's some grainy footage I caught in Cambridge just yesterday with my cell phone. And she told me she does whatever it takes to get a curb space in Cambridge. <laughs> well, uh, getting to the politics of this, uh, I think we can make the, the policies I recommend uh, uh, more feasible if you are very upfront with what you're doing with the meter money. Here's a, a sign on the parking meters in Pasadena saying where your meter money is going. And most of us here in Boston or Cambridge <laughs> think that we know where the meter money is going. Uh, uh, but uh, here's a picture of um, uh, in the neighborhood around the Los Angeles Coliseum during the 1984 Olympics. But it happens in every event at the Olympics, is that the people park their own cars on the street and they rent the spaces in their driveways to ticket holders. And um, 
uh, I think when the residents get the benefits, they know that the right parking shouldn't be free. I, I think it's not un-American to charge for parking. I think it's a very American value to charge people for what they use. We didn't become a great nation by being a bunch of freeloaders, except when it comes to parking. We think we can freeload our way to a great future. We're not. We're getting some temporary benefit. Uh, so how did this work out in Pasadena? Um, it was a commercial skid row. Uh, that most of the buildings were, were vacant above the first floor. Nobody thought it could ever revive. Here's what it looks like now. It's one of the most popular tourist destinations in, in Southern California. Uh, 30,000 people on a weekend come to walk around. Your sidewalks look empty compared to Pasadena's. <laughs> uh, and it came about because of this revenue return, that the merchants and the, and the um, uh, property owners bitterly opposed parking meters uh, until the city offered to say, if we put in the parking meters, all the revenue will go to pay for uh, public improvements in your area. And the merchant said, that's different. Why didn't you tell us that? Uh, let's run the meters till midnight. Let's run them on Sunday. <laughs> from going from bitterly opposing it and say, I see what you mean. Uh, what's taking you so long? Uh, and so for this small area, it yields over a um, uh, million dollars a year on 80 blocks. That's $80,000 per block per year. For act they rebuilt all of the um, uh, sidewalks and cleaned all the alleys. They appointed a, a committee to advise the city on how to spend the money. Here's a quote from one of the business leaders in the area who is the chairman of the commission saying that, uh, once we realized that the money would stay here, it was an easy sell. Uh, if the city insists on keeping the money in the general fund, it's not an easy sell. No, you, you'd have to do the most incredible convincing of every individual person. All you have to do is give them the money, and <laughs> they understand. Uh, so it led to really big changes. The, the buildings were in terrible shape after the city put in all new sidewalks, because they borrowed money against the future meter revenue, uh, and all new street trees, new street furniture. Um, uh, the, the landlords who had previously neglected their buildings because the restoration didn't pay, they scraped away decades worth of old paint on the bricks and things like that. Here's a tire warehouse that was empty for, for years. Um, and then it became a department store um, without any parking. Uh, and here's the typical alley uh, in Pasadena beforehand with dead animals and things. They cleaned out, put the wires underground, all with meter money, and planted trees, so it's now for cafes. It's a great place. Uh, so I think that these uh, parking benefits, uh, they have uh, two big purposes. One, they're a transportation <laughs> management tool, so we won't have all the cruising and the fuel use and the air pollution and things like that, that it gets a lot of good, good benefits for, for, for transportation. But it's also an economic development tool. If you have an area that's struggling and that uh, needs some public investment and you don't have any way for it to improve the sidewalks or the urban design, you get the money from the meters. Um, uh, And then the third thing to do, I think, is to remove these off-street parking requirements that we started out with. Uh, that here is, uh, I was speaking in my class, I speak a whole, a whole semester on this, so I'm uh, condensing a semester into one hour. Uh, but one of the students showed me that uh, 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 Google Earth now has um, uh, uh, capacity to look back in time. Uh, and so the, uh, they've, been, they've been watching us for a long time. And here's the same building in December 19, 2004 on a weekday. It looks like the building was new then. Uh, and it's always empty. It wasn't just one poor, the slow day. Uh, Google photographed it again and again and again. It's all on the web. And you can see, well, isn't that a waste of valuable land? Um, uh, it's always like that, and it's required to be like that. That building, those buildings are as big as they could be, given the size of the parking lot. Uh, and the parking lots themselves are quite nice when you go to them. Um, 
that it's a beautiful it, it's it's a beautiful place to be if you're a car. Uh, look at there are nice hillsides there with hillsides. It's a uh, <laughs> California has some wonderful areas, uh, but it's required to be parking. So. Uh, I just took, uh, used Photoshop to, to move some buildings from the University of, of London, which must have been clean, to say, well, suppose we remove the off-street parking requirements and said, you can build housing on the periphery of this lot if you want to. And you could use it for your own uh, 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 housing for your own workers, or you could make it market rate housing, or whatever you want. Now, um, that isn't the kind of thing that would be built in, in Silicon Valley. It might be built here. You could build anything there. You could build row houses. You could build garden apartments. The new urbanists call this a liner building. It lines the periphery of a parking lot. So as you're walking down the sidewalk, you don't know there's a parking lot behind it. You just see it's the real city. It could like a, <laughs> be like a street in Boston, but it wouldn't. So I took some buildings from downtown LA, just some garden variety apartment buildings to say, well, let's, give the, let's get out of the way and see what happens if we remove these parking requirements and allow housing to be built in this area. And if it works, if they made money, the land is already assembled in one ownership. It's not brownfields. You don't have to dig deep garages beneath it. You don't have to provide any parking for these at all because the people could walk across the parking lot. It would mean you'd have to start charging for the parking. But you would get job-adjacent housing of the sort that everybody says is what we need. And if it were, this is what it looks like in downtown LA. It's just, you know, just ordinary buildings. The ground floor, uh, I think it's uh, stores and a daycare center and things like that. So as you walk along the street, it would look like a real city. It could turn this wasteland into a nice urban environment. It would have to have better urban design than that, I hope. But you could see it, it could be happening. And there's no subsidy involved. Um, it's just allowing it to happen. Uh, so I think that the, um, there are a lot of good effects of this, that um, it would uh, create jobs because the, somebody would have to build this housing. Uh, you know, we could import cars and fuel, but we can't import apartment houses. I mean, if you were an electrician or a drywaller or a roofer or an architect or a planner or any of these professions, wouldn't you like to see this happening? Um, uh, and of course, it would increase the housing supply right where people want to be. It would uh, make commuting a lot better. And we wouldn't import so many, many cars and fuel. Um, and we have to say that it would slow climate change. Uh, and for the manufacturers out in the lobby, it would increase the demand for all this smart parking technology. You'd have to charge for on-street parking because you couldn't build house, housing without parking and expect the curb to be just miraculously take care of itself. It would have to have SF park-like pricing. And they'd have to have parking cash out in the garages, I mean, in the parking lots. So I think that, uh, that, that there can be a lot of political support for this, whether you come from the left or from the right, that you'll see some benefits of this. Uh, that uh, I think liberals will see, well, this is a new way to fund public services. Um, and uh, uh, Conservatives will see that we're moving away from regulations and toward markets to allocate resources. And certainly environmentalists have a lot to, to gain from this if, you, if it really does reduce energy consumption and, and now carbon emissions that we worry about. And businesses will see that uh, it unburdens enterprise, uh, that you, could, you can uh, have a business without having the government and say, well, where's the required parking? Um, and the new urbanists, of course, will see that this will make for this, the world will look better, uh, and we won't be um, overwhelmed with our cars if we live at higher density. And the libertarians have a lot to benefit, saying that the that you can do whatever you want. Um, and the people who are property rights advocates, and there are a lot of them, uh, they have something to gain, saying that that the government is not restricting my rights to do what I want with my property. And certainly developers have a lot to gain from this because it'll reduce the cost of what they do. It'll put them in charge of saying how much parking is needed. Uh, 
And the residents of any existing area will say, well, gee, there's this new money to pay from our public uh, uh, investments in our neighborhood. And some neighborhood activists will see that, uh, well, there's more local choices uh, that we can make. Uh, and I think one of the biggest beneficiaries will be these local elected officials. They won't have to go to city council meetings that last till midnight deciding on whether the price of parking should go up by a quarter an hour. Or what should be the parking requirement for an animal grooming studio. I mean, that's probably one of the worst things that politicians have to do is deal with parking. And it would mean that we're, we're unburdened from this, this responsibility. Um, I think that local elected officials have a lot to gain from this. So I think it's getting back to where we started that uh, the, the current system is so bad that by some minor reforms we could stop shooting ourselves in the feet. We couldn't stop hampering everything we want to do by ridiculous government re regulations and government mismanagement of the current parking supply. I think if, if you want to uh, appeal to the libertarians here is that the government uh, mismanages all the parking it owns and then says, interferes in the private sector saying, you have, you're not performing right. We're going to tell you what to do. I think it should be just the opposite, is that the government should manage what it owns and let go of what they don't own. Well, what will we do with all the cars that we won't need? Well, uh, here's a, a sculpture in France I like called Long-Term Parking. Uh, what about all the garages that we don't need? Uh, here's a gigantic one in, in, in the Netherlands. They found a very good use for this one. <laughs> I think there are a lot of college students in the Boston area who could, uh, who, who, who could do this for you. Uh, well, I, a planner can't uh, end anything without quoting Jane Jacobs, of course. Um, um, we're, we're not a wealthy country because of what you and I have done. Uh, we live in a wealthy country because we were born here, um, and we owe a lot to the past. Um, um, and I think, I hope we'll be seen as better ancestors <laughs> than we are now. We're not really leaving behind uh, us uh, a world that's as much better <laughs> Uh, for our ancestors, for our descendants, than what we received from our ancestors. Um, um, uh, here's a quote from uh, President Eisenhower, which really says pretty much the same thing. I, I imagine all presidents would have said this. Uh, it was in his famous uh, uh, industrial, military industrial complex speech, in his farewell address. Uh, and I don't think President Eisenhower could have conceived at the, the degree to which we are plundering for our own ease and convenience the precious resources of tomorrow. Um, and then Abraham Lincoln said it even in shorter terms. Uh, he's the greatest writer that we had. I think our case is new. Uh, and it's time to think anew and to act anew. Um, it's not often that you have a a lecture in Boston ending with quotations from two Republican presidents, I suppose. <laughs> uh, but we'll always have the parking problem with us, except uh, that there is some new technology. I don't know if the people in the lobby are working on this. It's more General Motors. And I think if General Motors succeeds with this, it will restore the leadership that we have in the automobile sector and will make unnecessary all the high-tech equipment that's in the lobby. Here's, here's just a sneak. Um, Thank you, obviously, uh, Professor Shoup. Thanks a lot for uh, what is obviously what I hope uh, revealing to most people in the room about the uh, great ways of doing parking. But I have a question for you. So um, as you showed on one of your slides, uh, a lot of people who would be able to accept many of these principles uh, in New England, certainly in Cambridge and Boston, the country certainly assumes we all 
bare left. <laughs> but but the truth is we're all Yankees, and we definitely like to keep right. It oh. has a lot to do with the wallet and the fear of raising prices. But what if, what if a city like Boston were to look at San Francisco that charges $6 an hour, and Chicago is now charging $7 an hour? Could we double it to, what, two fifty an hour? If we did that, if we had the political will, if we thought we could get there, what would we then do? That's going to be a lot of money in the coffers of the city, is the perception. Well, I wouldn't double it. I would just inch it up, just nudge it up. Uh, say in San Francisco, it only goes up by 25 cents an hour, uh, and no more than frequently than every six weeks. So that most people don't even know anything is happening. Uh, that uh, when you go to, to, of course in Boston, where everybody knows it's a buck and a quarter here, but most people in most cities don't know what the price of curb parking is. Uh, so I would say, I wouldn't talk about doubling the price of parking. I would just say, inch it up until you see the occupancy you want. And then to make it politically popular, it is not the same thing as in California because I think your, your public services look pretty good. I was talking to a professor at Cambridge, uh, at, at Harvard, uh, last night, and he said, well, Cambridge is so rich that there's nothing we could spend the money on. We have lots of tax revenue. <laughs> and uh, I was saying, it does look good. I mean, the, 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 the public services do look good uh, to a tourist. I only, uh, I, there, there's some ragged parts of town, definitely, but uh, I think that, uh, uh, one of the easiest things to do is um, what Boulder did. Boulder does, Colorado does a lot of good things. Is that uh, to really communicate to people downtown that they needed parking meters? They committed the parking meter revenue to pay for free public transit passes for everybody who worked in downtown. So that if you work downtown, you have a free transit pass. And that's a free fringe benefit for every employer. Every employer can give a free transit pass to their employees paid for by the parking meters. And that reduces the demand for parking. That would mitigate the, the increase in the, in the price of, uh, of curb parking. But that's just a very easy, simple, um, a software kind of thing. Say, yeah, well, we're going to increase the price of parking in Boston. And I, I don't think that the city could get very much net revenue out of its meters because the price is so low. They have all the physical costs of the meters, you know, repairing them and collecting the coins and things like that. Um, so the expenses uh, uh, would be a high percentage of the, of the gross revenue, and I bet the net revenue isn't very high. I should have looked that up. But if you, if you do inch the price up, uh, that all of that revenue is, 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 gross re is, is net revenue because the costs remain the same and the revenue goes up. So there's a lot of incremental revenue as you, as you nudge up the price. And I think that if you... Um, and uh, then said uh, we will also, uh, say in Pasadena, what do they spend the money on? They steam clean the sidewalks uh, uh, twice a month. Uh, they sweep them every night. They remove graffiti every night. Um, they have added police protection. They have police patrols uh, on horseback on weekends, which are just decorative. Uh, but they, they probably reduce a, a lot of... Uh, of, uh, uh, of uh, 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 infractions. <laughs> One of the things that uh, that uh, I really like that it could happen in Boston, or maybe not Boston, but uh, parts of Boston that don't have meters and they wanted to have meters, um, it happened in a town called Ventura in in in, in California. They they bought the idea of a parking benefit district, they put in the meters, and they uh, then you have to have meter enforcement, so they hired police cadets. A lot of people would like to become police officers, but it was hard to get into the force, and it was during unemployment, so there were a lot of police interns that they called cadets. They had nine of them, and they, um, uh, uh, they, they were sort of ambassadors, they gave tickets, they showed people how to use the meters and things like that. And the crime rate fell by 40% in the first year just because of the meter people, <laughs> the, 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 the uh, uniformed meter. They, they were dressed like real policemen. Um, 
and the crime rate fell. And the, another thing I think that could be done to make the beaters popular that they did in Ventura is the beaters have to communicate with uh, the, your headquarters to validate credit cards and adjust prices every month. Um, but that, isn't, uh, that doesn't use a lot of bandwidth. They communicate with Wi-Fi. Um, most meters communicate with um, uh, cell phones, but you can operate with Wi-Fi. They have batteries in the meters, but then it goes uh, low power up to a router on a light pole, which has the, uh, the uh, uh, grid supply, and then that at high power communicates it to City Hall. They realized they had a lot of excess capacity, so they opened up all the Wi-Fi uh, to anybody who lived in the area. So the meters are now associated with Wi-Fi. If you have meters in your neighborhood, you have free Wi-Fi. If you don't have meters, you don't have free Wi-Fi. And that's an immediate, if you want instant gratification, as soon as the meters come in, <laughs> the Wi-Fi comes in. People understand that. Say with Pasadena, that took several years to rebuild all the sidewalks and, and get everything in great shape. Uh, but I think that, uh, I guess, I hope that answers the question. There's a lot to do with the money. Well, I think you point to instant gratification. We're slowly trying to uh -huh. get there, but things move at a glacial pace. Uh -huh. um, I want to talk a little bit about some communities in Massachusetts who are trying to reflect upon this. But one thing is important. I don't want to be the only person asking questions. So there's comment cards or question cards that everybody has at their table. Can you hold those up in the air so uh, the staff here, if you've got any questions for, for Professor Shoup, um, please hold those up, and we'll, we'll pull them up to the front, and we'll be asking him some questions. I actually have one right here up front. We'll do this for just a couple minutes before we start talking a little bit about the, the local examples. I'm going to ask, we have some panelists right away, and we will go to coffee within the hour. Please uh, bear with us. Thank you. I have some panelists who are going to come up here and join the professor. You guys can come on up from uh, both Salem and Cambridge, and they'll have some questions as well. Um, but they also want to tell a little bit about some of the success stories in Massachusetts. Uh, but this question is saying uh -huh. here, sometimes well, nice curb space sure. used for parking might be better used for something else. And this is sort of along the lines of what you were saying, Professor Shoup. Uh, doesn't creating an entrenched interest in parking revenue make it much harder to reallocate spaces, uh, sorry, space on the street afterwards? Complex question. Uh, question. No. <laughs> I think that uh, one of the things that the, these market prices show is that the, uh, uh, the, the value of the street isn't as high as they thought. Uh, that, that in San Francisco, the prices actually went down after this SF park. What I think will uh, be very beneficial, say for, I don't know what, uh, what you're, you're thinking of, whether it's parklets or bike lanes or something like that, it will show where the spaces are not worth very much at all. I think some of the, the, the premier bike lanes are not on uh, the busiest streets with the most expensive parking. There would be a block or two away, and it, you would realize it would be very cheap to take out those parking spaces, those curb spaces. I, I think that... Um, uh, another advantage is, is if you're going to have parklets, has that happened here in Boston already? I think somebody's going to talk about that and today. Pop-up yeah. parks that they convert a curb parking space into a restaurant. Uh, it's extremely popular in Europe and is now popular in California and New York City is doing it. They, in a, in a, wet, a cold climate, they convert it back into parking during the winter. Uh, so it's just a pop-up meeting. It comes and goes. Uh, but uh, if, if you can um, uh, uh, manage the prices properly, taking away one space for a parklet is not catastrophic. People can say, oh, these parking spaces are irreplaceable or precious or something like that because the, the price will adjust a little bit, so there'll still be one or two open spaces. Now, I think it will make it uh, uh, much more, uh, the more we can commercialize parking, um, uh, or uh, the, the, the Marxists would call it commoditizing parking, as though that's an awful thing, but commodity stems from the Latin word commodus, meaning convenient. <laughs> the more parking is convenient, it, it was a, the arena cutler in Philadelphia is that parking should be friendly but not free. Uh, friendly meaning it's available and uh, easy to pay for and 
uh, it's getting easier and easier to pay for with uh, credit cards or pay by cell phone or now pay by sky, as you'll see out in the, in the lobby. No, I, I think that's a, you know, a conceivable worry, but I think it's, it, I think it's ridiculous when you think that here, Boston charges $1.25 an hour and everybody say it would be inconceivable to take away a current parking space because it's so valuable and so precious and so hard to get. Uh, if you started charging maybe $4 an hour and you always saw empty spaces, it wouldn't seem that unthinkable to have a cafe in a restaurant, in a, in a parking space. Well, that's my combative response. I but <laughs> it's very valid. So I've got another quick question, and we're going to move on to the next segment. And I think this is actually very appropriate for maybe even the majority of folks in the room, because we hear this all the time. Uh, does this approach, more or less, to performance-based pricing work well in suburban areas without good public transportation? We hear that a lot. I, I think that it, it um, I don't see why it wouldn't. Uh, the getting the price right <laughs> doesn't depend on having good public transportation. Uh, I mean, if, if you don't have good public transportation, then you depend more on parking. You need the right price for parking more. If you're in Boston, many people don't care about the right price of parking because they take public transit. That if you rely on parking, it's more important to get the price right, not less important. It's perfect. So we're going to take more questions. So if you have other questions for, for Don, please write them down. Um, and we'll ask a little bit more at the end of this before we break for coffee and we go into the breakout sessions. Uh, but I want to hear from our panelists in a second and have them talk about their perspectives on parking in the state. I'm going to briefly kind of uh, give Professor Shoup sort of an overview of what we're trying to do in terms of best practice in the state really quickly. And um, I'm Jason Schreiber with, with Nelson Nygaard, and I've worked with a number of these communities you'll see here. Um, and these, this image on the screen is very indicative. I'm not even going to tell you where it is. You may have been looking at it long enough and you figured out which local community it is. Oof. Here's Oof. another one which has got it's a whole you. bunch of parking signs and tons and tons of regulations. And this is a very common way of managing parking throughout the Commonwealth. This one's a little bit more funny because it's actually from California. But we do it in such of our own beautiful way. This happens to be a very wonderful island place of Massachusetts. And it's all very, very restrictive. It's all very, very piecemeal. There are places who've tried to become Shupistas and learn a little bit. This is Nashua, New Hampshire. Um, they have a very active and vibrant downtown, but it's had a hard time making it continue to be active and vibrant because literally the, the sidewalks can crumble and break. And they've long had a plan for major streetscape improvements to go forward, but again, funding in local municipalities is very low. So their economic de development director actually went through a process to completely change how they priced the parking in their downtown. They did have flat pricing. They went to this performance-based pricing with a dollar or 75 cents, 50 cents, depending on your proximity to downtown, and also extended and even eliminated the time limits that they used to have in all their downtown spaces, the core being 90, then going to two hours, and eventually the furthest spaces that were the cheapest had no time limit. And this has been a huge part of making parking available in Nashua. This is just some of the, the quotes from the merchant community in Nashua because they recognized that the customer could get in and now there was available parking. But more importantly, the city now has extra revenues it can start dedicating over time to its streetscape improvement project. Hopefully there's a cycle of investment that's good. In Massachusetts, Haverhill, who we'll hear speaking, I think, in one of the next breakout sessions, has been doing this just recently. They uh, implemented pricing in their downtown for the first time in something like 50 years. It always been the free, more or less, time limit parking. And they brought in the right kind of technologies, but did it again only in the zone where really there was a lot of demand and have timed it only at the times of day when there's a lot of demand, which is after two in the afternoon. And again, a lot of the merchant community, a lot of the people who responded, the first responses are, are, are saying some of these quotes. You know, this is, this is common sense. Why hasn't this happened before I can actually get downtown? Uh, slowly but surely, there's examples in the state that are working well. Portsmouth, New Hampshire, going again just across the line. Uh, they've got some performance-based based pricing they've done in their downtown, uh, re finally reducing the cost of their garage. 
uh, and increasing some costs on their street. Lowell Mass has brought in some really great technologies, pay by space, um, trying to move to the, the next realm of managing that pricing cleverly. This is Lawrence, who also brought in pricing on their main streets um, and manages that privately and is thinking about working very coordinatedly. But we're first going to hear from um, our first panelist, Lynn Duncan, who is the uh, Community Development Director in Salem. And Salem is an absolutely you know, wonderful coastal community and has had a lot of great change in recent years. This is new development. This is a picture of a courthouse, the renovation of a old historic Salem Witches Jail and all this into beautiful downtown housing. But we started working with them several years ago and the perception of what parking problems were or how it was behaving was so bad they actually had details coming to the first, pu police details coming to the first public meetings because it was going to be the throngs with torches coming in and saying don't change this system, don't change how parking works in our community. And if you actually look at this as a map of all the parking regulations, they, like all those earlier images, had tons and tons of parking regulations, a whole plethora of how to manage their downtown. Today, I think it's been limited to something like four as a result of the changes that Lynn is going to talk about. Um, and they were to such extremes, you could literally on Hawthorne Street find seven, diff seven different regulations, completely customer and friendly, but very much the response of politics over time. Uh, and as a result, availability on the street was hit and miss. One block could be filled up, around the corner it could be empty, and the patron wouldn't really know because they were afraid that the regulation that they found to be able to park in was the one that they were most familiar with and might get a ticket around the corner. And so uh, Lynn's going to talk a little bit about the process to get to the change that they're, they've seen recently. Great. Good morning. So these are the five themes I'm going to just touch on briefly. Uh, you heard about many of these themes from Professor Shoup. So these are an overview of Salem's comprehensive parking plan. The key recommendations were actually adopted by City Council a few years ago. Uh, yes, I do. And then I need to know how to use it. Okay, there we go. So the need for a parking study was recommended in response to discussion of redevelopment of a surface parking lot. So that brought up the issue of, well, do we need the parking in the surface parking lot? Uh, so we should do a parking, a comprehensive parking study. So the focus for us was really to encourage economic development and continued revitalization of our downtown, uh, which falls under the responsibilities of the Planning and Community Development Department. So we're not the parking department, but because it was economic development, we took this on. So the, one of the keys out of a survey of over 600 responses, about two-thirds or almost two-thirds of the people surveyed said that on occasion they had failed to find a parking spot, so they just left. So this was clearly concerning uh, as it impacted our downtown viability and vitality. I think you saw a similar slide from Professor Shoup. So people would complain um, that there was no parking in downtown Salem and you could not find a place to park. So this photo shows the deck of our parking garage right in the heart of our downtown and this is just on an average day. It's totally empty. So as part of the comprehensive parking study, our consultant, uh, you can see that was Nelson Nygaard, did uh, utilization counts. And this uh, table shows the utilization over the course of a day. The red are the available parking spaces. So no matter what time of, public, uh, no, what time of day, there were always spaces available. So out of our public supply, and this is not counting the privately owned spaces downtown, but out of our public supply of about 3,500 spaces, we had nearly 800 vacant, even at the busiest period. So this is about a 78% utilization rate um, lower than what we're looking for. More, we're looking for about 85 or even 90 percent in our garages. If spaces are available, why was the perception different? And the key is that on-street availability is really what uh, governs the perception of available parking. So our parking was uh, structured to encourage people to park on the street because these spaces were the least expensive. 
even though they were the most valuable. So for us, for me particularly, the aha moment was when we realized that we could build 10 new parking garages, 20 new parking garages, and it would not change the perceived parking shortages. So when we were originally talking about that um, surface parking lot, and people said we should build another parking garage there instead of some type of commercial retail or housing development, that would not impact the perception of our parking shortage at all. So our pricing system resulted in lack of availability on the prime streets. We inconvenienced residents and visitors, and we left our garages underutilized. So here are um, goals, objectives, and some of the key uh, recommendations. For Salem, this was definitely a non-conventional approach. First, we established the goal um, that you heard about of having a 15% vacancy on street, which was roughly one space available for every um, eight spaces, so one space per block. And then the key recommendation was to implement the relative pricing, demand responsive pricing, or um, could call it uh, the performance-based pricing. And uh, this shows the proposed relative pricing. So our high demand areas are priced more than the low demand areas, and the on-street parking is priced more than off-street. So we increased the cost to park on the street, uh, now ranges from 50 cents an hour uh, to $1.50 in the most desirable location. We reduced the cost to park in our garages. So the least convenient garage is 25 cents an hour. Um, the garage in the heart of the downtown is 75 cents, still less expensive than those on-street uh, spaces. So we put customers first. We uh, created turnover and vacancies of the most convenient spaces to ensure availability. And this was done through, this is um, key, and you'll hear a little bit more about this from Renus, actually. Um, we did this through pricing rather than time limits. So the turnover was created by pricing. So we were able to increase our time limits to four hours. So people were able to stay longer in the downtown. So they could um, go shopping and then they would still have time to eat lunch out instead of having to go back to their two hour meter and then perhaps just leave because once you got back to the car, uh, that was easier to do. So there's another um, component of the economic development the recommendation from our consultant was to get rid of time limits, and we would have loved to have uh, uh, done that. We couldn't quite get there, so we are able to go from two hours to four hours. So collaboration was key to our success. Our working group included representatives from all of the stakeholders. And actually, I'd like to acknowledge the um, work of Tom Daniel, who is here today at the back of the room. He was really the uh, key person responsible for the success of this initiative. And I know that he will be speaking in more detail about uh, Salem's comprehensive parking plan and especially the process on one of the um, workshops this afternoon. So even if you do not have a municipal garage or you're a more suburban location, policies such as demand responsive Pricing, extension, or even the elimination of time limits can be successfully applied to better manage your parking system. Thank you. Uh, so, Lynn, uh, first of all, if there's any other questions, not only related to Don, but also to the panelists, please, again, fill them out. Hold up your hand every now and then, and somebody will grab your card so that we can actually read those questions um, at the end of this session. Uh, but I did want to ask a quick question of, of you, Lynn. Uh, during that study, the MBTA was also building or planning to build and is now nearing finalization on a 1,500-car parking garage right near the downtown. Has there been any discussions with them on how that will be managed as part of the overall system? No. <laughs> Wish, wishful thinking, is it something that the, the folks in your, both the city but also the business community have looked at as a threat or something that could benefit them? No, I think we definitely see it as um, an opportunity. So the MBTA has their uh, sort of standard uh, pricing, whether it's the right price or not, I don't know. Um, so one of the issues in Salem that many communities may not have, of course, we have Halloween season which increases our demand 
for parking. Five seasons in Salem, right? Spring, summer, winter, fall, Halloween. Um, so we definitely see uh, the commuter rail station parking, um, which will be empty mostly on Saturdays and Sundays, um, sort of providing that concept of shared parking when we need uh, more parking downtown. It also means we have a lot of residents that are living downtown now, which is great because I really think that they've driven uh, the revitalization of our downtown, creating the need for restaurants and retail. Um, but during snow emergencies, since uh, they don't have off-street parking, during snow emergencies, our garages get filled. And in fact, planning department staff sometimes get to work and have to go home because there's no place to park. So we also see the MBTA garage now providing um, that release, if you will, uh, to the pent-up demand during snow emergency days. So um, I think it's great, and I think it will be definitely an asset. Um, it's, a, it's a big investment for eight snow emergency days a year, but they do have other users. <laughs> Which is why, as you know, Jason, we took that off the table when we were doing the comprehensive parking plan and said we weren't going to do our comprehensive parking plan um, based around the few weekends during Halloween season right. or during snow emergencies. Right, which is also a good point because many people plan to Christmas and how can you possibly survive. So it's interesting also we have Rena Solstuck with the Salem Chamber of Commerce representing a lot of the businesses in downtown. Um, and, you know, they again were the ones who came to the table screaming and yelling about what this change might mean. And we had to do a lot of negotiation, but they're active partners in this. So, Rena, please share briefly your experiences. Thank you, and thank you for having me here, being one of the few non-experts in the room um, and a foreigner nonetheless. Um, I want to just talk about a couple of things that you never hear, even in, in, in Professor Shoup's uh, presentation, that's politics. What we all, have, all do has to do with what you can get through and what you can make work. And one of the things that you'll, you'll hear from me is, is it's, it's you're trying to do what's doable. And if I hear Jason and, and, and Lynn talk about the plan, um, you'll see in, in, in uh, the first slide, there were about 10 recommendations. These are the first seven. All of them are important. Then we get the next till 10. But the most important part is what's left out of the plan, the X factor. What we could not get through through city council was essentially a, a, a possibility of having a, a separate group or an organization within the city that would monitor the plan. So we have pricing that's now all done the right way we have a system that we think actually works but who's looking at it and essentially the answer is we have a planning board who implemented this with the help of Jason with the help of Tom Daniel who's now in Gloucester and now that's it the plan that's it and and essentially I'll, I'll, I'll let you know that the planning board is not actively involved anymore the parking board that I recently joined is only involved in the structures and the surface lots. They're not allowed by ordinance to look at the streets. And then the city council is responsible for the on-street parking. So the on-demand portion or the flexible portion of the adjustment portion, uh, you don't see that in Salem right now. Um, what actually was implemented? 8 to 8 p.m., great, everybody loved it, the retailers loved it, they, they, they was, were going to see more spaces available for their shoppers, for the restaurants, etc. Variable pricing, long-term meters, off-street more affordable than, than on-street, and that actually was the big trick for Salem, and, and I think it's, it, it makes the plan work. Um, and um, we also added a low-cost option for employees, and, and we haven't heard about that. We, we have or we implemented two areas for $25 a month parking, which are probably only two, three blocks from the downtown. And that was fantastic, because that essentially takes away the argument in a lot of ways on why parking doesn't work and why meter feeding is the optimum way to park your car. Um, we did do a little outreach program, um, but these are the things that we implemented. What was not implemented in the big list is a whole lot of things that have to do with downtown residents. Um, we didn't do anything about the tour buses. Um, as I said, the ongoing men monitoring did not happen, is still not happening. And the, the parking fund to essentially reestablish some money to put back into the downtown. We've always had meters. We've always had the money going to the general fund. That's still the case. So maybe that little devil in the ground is still there taking all the money. There is no extra money to invest it. And, and um, 
Additional recommendations, modern parking systems. We had a partial installation of smart meters, and that was only in the highest use portion of town, and the rest of town is now wondering, why not us? And one of the reasons they're asking why not us is because on a daily basis, we get people looking for quarters. We now have $75 an hour, a dollar an hour, 150 an hour, and if you don't have smart meters in front of your business, guess what? People come in all the time looking for quarters. It, it doesn't work. Um, so we are pushing very hard to find that money somehow and install those meters. Um, and, and essentially, despite all the non-implemented uh, 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 portions, I will say it's working as far as we can tell. Meaning, no data, but anecdotally, we, in, we ask our chamber members, we ask at meetings that we go to, we ask our, our residents as well as our businesses, and we, we think it's working. Um, those in the know, it's really easy to park in Salem now. There's always spaces, there's always the one spot a block, there's always, it, it, it has really helped. Um, even the uh, financial incentive to park in the garage, that empty parking lot on top, that is changing now. People are parking in the garages and utilizing it more. Um, even our customers, the million tourists, etc., find parking now. So essentially what I'm saying, it's working as far as we can tell. Um, what, of course, is still happening is everybody's talking about the way you all talk about parking. Everybody always talks about parking. There is no parking. That comment we still hear, and then you start digging into it, and you say, what do you do? Well, you drive around the block, and there's no parking. But if you would go to the lot, there would be plenty of parking. So it's more a matter of perception, and we still haven't dealt with that. Um, the PR portion of our plan still needs a lot of work. It's still a matter of when you drive into town, how do you tell people they've gotten there and they should park and walk, and, and being a good Dutchman, it's all about walking, and, and I, I think that's the secret to, to any of our downtowns, and, and we have to get there. Um, the unfortunate thing, though, is, is and, and I'll keep it short, um, since implementation, which is now about a year and a half, two years ago, um, because there is nobody in charge of the plan, different people have started looking at the plan again and made changes, and as we say, not helpful, <laughs> not helpful, and, and it's both, or all, it's the mayor's office, it's the city council, it's businesses that complained and got politically active and got sign-in sheets, and so what happened over the last two, two years already, no more 8, 8 p.m., and we totally disagree with that. We think the whole plan is sort of a failure, despite the fact that I'm saying it's working, because we went back to 6 p.m., because we now have people coming into town at 2, 3, 4 in the afternoon, find that meter, take the spot, and go to work. They, our restaurant scene is fantastic. There's so many people working there, they take a lot of spots. And, and so essentially, that's a killer. That was city council who did that. Then we had uh, the employee parking. We had two zones, as I said in the beginning. One of them works very well with, with 70, 80, 90% occupancy. The other zone was eliminated because in the first six months, not enough people used it. And instead of a marketing campaign to change that, they just decided, let's, let's take it away. And so this, on the half portion of town, there is no employee parking anymore. We don't think that's helpful. Um, finally, in a couple of locations, two-hour meters and even 15 minutes meters have returned. And I think that has to do with the fact that we are not doing the on-demand pricing, but we just have a set price without being able to make those adjustments. And that is a, a failure of the plan, in a sense. Despite all of that, it's working. I just don't know where to find the data to tell you why. Thank you, Renus. <laughs> so um, obviously, Renus has drunk the Kool-Aid, but I assume there's uh, a few other merchants in the community who also thought it was good, at least at one point in time. But it's a good point that these things are needing to always be paid attention to, and it's hard to. I'm going to shift gears a little bit because I want to get us to the coffee break. Um, and Cambridge is here sort of in a different spectrum. We're going to talk a little bit more about off-street parking and parking requirements here. Um, one thing to remember about Cambridge, Cambridge wasn't always this wonderfully beautiful. I mean, Cambridge has done a lot to try to get here, um, and it's encouraged a lot of good infill development. But once upon a time, Cambridge was just like any other community, lots of cars driving through. 
um, lots of traffic jams in lovely Harvard Square, um, and also a lot of plans for major highway expansion. Of course, Cambridge was right there at the beginning of the whole um, highway revolt and, and fought against uh, these lovely highways that were going to cut right through some of the best parts of, of Cambridge. And this particular area, um, of course, today is University Park um, uh, between Central Square and Kendall Square. And it's got a lot of great development. And, but a big part of this story is understanding the parking equations behind making these beautiful walkable spaces that the development did um, ultimately bring in. And, and what's great is that thinking about this smartly has made Cambridge literally the most walkable community in uh, America, supposedly at least by certain measures. And that's a great story. They're seeing declining amounts of traffic as their density goes up. This is like a national best practice story. Um, and it really has to do with the progression of the right kind of policies. I won't mention all of these. Over the course of just the last couple of decades, they really started to think a lot differently about the, their downtown. And we have with us today uh, Stephanie Grohl. She's the PTDM planning officer for the city. Um, and the PTDM ordinance is one of the more model ordinances for controlling uh, parking growth in the country. Thank you, Jason. Um, I'm excited to be here. So in the 90s, we started thinking about how to reduce single occupancy vehicle use. And after 10 years of de development, we have found that it worked. Um, see, this Globe article was a pivotal moment for us because it told us that the public understood that it worked too. Um, Car-free commuting push pays off in Kendall Square. Front page, lead story. We added 4 million square feet of development in Kendall Square over 10 years, and traffic remained the same and even declined on some streets. That's with 4% more residents and 4% more employees citywide. <coughs> so this news was so shocking, people didn't believe it. They said it was absolutely impossible. So the, the Globe ran a follow-up editorial with more research supporting city policies. And the message was, new development does not have to mean new drivers. This was really big news because it reframed the goal of reducing driving from being an environmental issue to also being an economic development issue. So the big question was, what happened to all the traffic? A few things. Um, we stopped designing our streets for more cars and started focusing on making everything as bikeable and walkable as possible. And progressive, I'm sorry, years of progressive city policies were starting to pay off. City Council was responding to an environmental imperative when it um, gave city staff a clear directive to get people walking, biking, and taking transit. And all of these policies basically say travel by single occupancy vehicles should be a last resort. And the last thing that happened was there's just a cultural shift across the country. People are driving less everywhere. And because we had our policies in place, it put us in a good position to really jump on this trend. So one of those policies is the Parking and Transportation Demand Management Ordinance. And under the Clean Air Act, the city <coughs> counted up all the parking spaces on non-residential parcels. And when a property owner increases parking on their site, then it triggers PTDM. We set the limit on SOV um, trips. And we don't care very much how property owners meet that limit, but they have to meet it. And we provide some guidance to developers on how they can re reduce their drive alone trips. And then they have to demonstrate every year that they are meeting it. And the PTDM ordinance also has a, an enforcement provision in case they're not meeting it, which says that the city can charge um, property owners $10 per space per day and shut down their parking facility until they come back into compliance. Um, that we've never had to enforce because just the threat of enforcement has brought people back into compliance. So we require a range of transportation demand management measures and experiment with pushing for different ways to help people meet their SOV goal. And then we want to spin them into larger city, city policies if possible. So for example, the city required all new properties in Kendall Square to um, provide a shuttle to North Station, which provided the financial support for the Easy Ride shuttle, which is run by the Charles River TMA. And it's a wildly successful shuttle with more than half a million riders a year now. The success of the PTDM ordinance can also be seen in our mode shift. This chart shows um, 
how people commute to work in Cambridge regardless of origin. And you can see that there was a five point drop in the number of drive alone, five percentage point drop in the number of drive alone rates. And transit and biking are up. Walking stayed high. It didn't change, but it stayed high. So here's where parking fits in. Projects with an oversupply of parking have a really difficult time meeting their SOV goal. There's a very clear relationship between that. Um, we've brought parking ratios down from 1.3 to 1.1 bases per thousand square feet um, between 2009 and 2013, and we have uh, approved recent projects at 0.8 and 0.9 ratios. When PTDM started, the city was recommending parking reductions in every development, and property owners had a very hard time accepting that. Um, but over time, developers realized that they were building too much parking because their parking has sat empty. So now when they come in the door, they come in with proposals to reduce parking, which we love because um, not only does it discourage driving, but it also a developer who isn't spending money on parking is going to be spending it on retail amenities or other ways to improve the urban environment because that makes their development more valuable. So we often tell companies, if you want acres of free parking, you will be happy with a suburban location. <laughs> but if you want your employees to walk to, um, be able to walk to lunch in Cambridge and bump into colleagues on the street, sorry, <laughs> come to Cambridge. Um, we know that we want a transportation system that is child-friendly and safe and that we want people to drive less. Developer, developers accept this as the price of doing business in Cambridge. Companies um, are recruiting employees who want an urban environment. People want to be here because we held our line, not in spite of it. How's that for preening? <laughs> um, <laughs> The last thing we want to say is that this kind of program doesn't have to be specific to Cambridge. <laughs> um, the details will be different, but there are many aspects that are important if you want to launch this kind of program in your community. So number one, make sure you pass an ordinance that gives you leverage when negotiating with developers. Number two, make your traffic and parking assumptions match to or below the um, SOV rates the property owners say they're going to achieve. And number three, um, annual monitoring is absolutely essential. I have piles of data in my office and that helps us understand that PTDM really is a success and it helps us advocate for enhanced TDM in our planning, um, in our larger planning efforts. And lastly, I just want to point out that Cambridge isn't saying that nobody can drive. We're, we just designed a system so that it makes it easy to choose not to drive. And um, it's no longer the default choice. And because ultimately we want economic development that brings that doesn't bring new traffic and doesn't bring new greenhouse gas emissions. Um, uh, Doug Manns is with HYM Investments, who's currently the property developer for North Point. North Point has gone from planning vision to uh, bricks and mortar uh, rather quickly. If you're ever driving on the north side of downtown Boston, you're seeing the steel going up as we all speak. Um, what's happened there is really a good example of this and even to a hyper extreme, um, as Doug will explain. Thank you. Um, good morning and I'll try to, I think I have what, 30 seconds left now? <laughs> Um, so I'm with the HYM Investment Group. We are developers of North Point, but also the redevelopers of the Government Center Garage as well. So we have a lot of experience in particular with shared parking. Um, but I'm going to talk about um, North Point very briefly today. So North Point is a 45-acre uh, mixed-use development site that's located in uh, East Cambridge, Massachusetts. It's the former Boston and Maine rail yards. Um, it was originally permitted back in 2002-2003. And when it was first permitted, it was permitted with 4,980 parking spaces. Uh, and again, it is for a 45-acre site. Um, it was permitted and approved for a total of 5.2 million square feet. So it's one of the largest redevelopment sites in the greater Boston area. Um, it splits down to about 3 million square feet of residential, which could be condos or apartments, um, and about 2 million square feet of commercial, um, which includes about 300,000 square feet of retail, uh, hotel, and the majority is actually office and lab space. Um, 20 development parcels in total, and right now two are complete, S and T, which are condominium buildings, fully sold out, and then uh, parcel N is under construction, that's the steel that's going up today, and that's 355 units in a high-rise uh, rental building. 
Um, it's a very dynamic project, and uh, we're really excited to be working with the City of Cambridge on this. Um, hopefully some of you guys can read this. Um, you know, key item for us from a development point of view is that parking does not pay for itself. It doesn't matter where you are, whether it's suburban, um, inner suburban, or urban. Um, the costs go up dramatically. Um, after I was a bit dismayed seeing the earlier presentation on the average costs, and I've already uh, emailed my general contractor, we need to talk. Um, <laughs> you know, we're, we're seeing costs, especially in a union urban market, um, you know, above grade spaces that are integrated into a building are easily 50 grand a piece. And below grade spaces in Boston, when you get into a bathtub type situation like the seaport, easily can hit 100,000, you know, per space. It limits the ability to do your layouts. I mean, you, you, a lot of our buildings are impacted by the grid of, you know, a 27 by 27 foot grid and the lower level of parking. So anyways, but um, that's one issue. The second issue is, and this really goes back to zoning parameters, um, is that, you know, we're not efficiently using our parking spaces in most of our developments. And so our goal is obviously to get better returns. But in essence, right now, we're subsidizing our parking costs from the other uses. And that's a key thing for developers. Um, permit challenges is that, you know, at least what we found in urban areas, no neighborhoods want above grade parking, which is the more cost effective way for us to approach parking. And the more parking that we have, the more difficult it is to get permitted and approved for it. And then we end up lining it with full facades. So again, parking can be very expensive. And then we typically hit two. Trip generation is probably the biggest single issue that we have with any development. And again, that's suburban or urban. Trip generation is what's slowing our ability to build actual larger buildings or more dynamic projects. So. Um, and then, you know, kind of market challenges and uh, commercial and broker tenant resistant. Well, this one's a funny story. So, so we have North Point, uh, great site. We've offered it to a lot of build suit tenants. We'll say we'll give you one space per uh, thousand square feet or 0.9 now per thousand square feet spaces. We'll throw in two T stations, a commuter rail station, a hubway station, plenty of bike paths. What do you think? And they come back. How about four spaces per thousand? <laughs> And we just stare at them and say, well, well I can't give you that. Um, but this really shows also a demographic shift of companies now moving into the city, but they're coming from suburban locations where everyone drives. And it is a big disruption because the commuting patterns of their folks were never on you know, commuter rail or subway. So, but it, it's a big challenge for us. So, um, but it's something that we've been going through. Obviously, limited precedent and examples of shared parking. So, and then obviously there's always this caveat of a lot of commercial tenants want reserve parking, um, at least a percentage of it. They want to know they can pull right into a spot and not worry about it. And that's another challenge that we have. So, um, so anyways, now I'm going to show a couple of charts, which I'm not going to try to interpret. Um, but this is, so VHB is our uh, traffic engineer. And, um, you know, and again, it's funny, traffic engineer as opposed to parking engineer. We need more parking engineers from the earlier discussion. Um, but they helped us a lot with really trying to understand a shared parking concept, and it's probably hard to read this, but this is basically showing the, the parking demand of different uses on our site. And what's really key for us, this is based upon urban model too. In a suburban model, you might actually get a bigger dip on the residential parking. The residential are the ones that are dipping down during the day. You know, the commercial are the ones that are peaking during the day. And, you know, about the middle is where the, you know, call it noon in the middle of the graph. Uh, but that's just really important. So we did a lot of analysis, and that was one of them. The second one, again, which is really hard to read, but it starts to show there's a lot of analysis that goes into it. Peak is also different during different parts of the year. Um, retail is also a struggle for us to integrate because retail peaks December, and it needs a lot of parking. So how do we do overflow in a mixed-use development? But you know, again, it just kind of shows you all the analysis that we uh, had to go through to get to this point. Um, but so right now, I would say the key thing for us is that, uh, besides working with PHB, is that this has been a partnership with the city of Cambridge uh, very closely. So we're working with the traffic department, Sue Clippinger and Adam Schulman, who have been instrumental with this, as well as Stephanie. It really takes uh, almost a joint venture effort with the city of Cambridge because we then have to collectively go sell this to the neighborhoods um, or to the tenants that we're leasing to. And that's not an easy thing because there are not a lot of examples of how this has worked successfully yet. And so we, we struggle with that. But the reason why this kind of works for North Point is that North Point will be considered its own parking district. So it won't be building by building. Um, the whole thing will be considered a district. And the one thing I forgot to mention too is that at North Point, and this has actually helped what we're doing here, we actually have 11 acres of open space on a 45 acre site. And that's over almost 25% of our site is open space. Um, but reducing parking helps that ability to hit that as well. So shared parking obviously is critical for it. And to the point now where we're looking at with the city of Cambridge, a reduction from 49 
80 spaces to 3,800 spaces. So almost an 1,100 parking space reduction, um, which is quite significant. Um, so I won't go through all this because we're running out of time, but we're updating uh, zoning ratios with the City of Cambridge right now to be consistent with other districts as well. But we're actually going below those requirements still. So I think we could actually get up towards 4,200 spaces with these new regulations. We're still going lower than that to about 3,800. So we'd be capping the actual um, district. Um, and this has a, a major city benefit, you know, for the city of Cambridge, which is, is actually going to, it will cap peak vehicular trips, which is a key consideration because we are constraining the supply. And so that's a key item, I think, for the uh, city of Cambridge. Um, again, I won't read all of these, but kind of hit the highlights. But key item for us to work, though, is there has to be flexibility within the North Point District. So although the zoning has set a maximum number of spaces and we agreed to a lower number of spaces, there has to be a lot more flexibility within the uses themselves. For example, on residential, it can vary widely. We will build an apartment building today in Boston or in Cambridge and only have 0.5 spaces per unit. Won't even blink. Our lenders won't blink. For us to do a condominium building, it has to have at least one space per unit. Um, part of it is the value of those condominiums. And it doesn't mean it has to be a deeded space. It just simply has to have a right to park because no one's going to buy a $750,000 you know, $750, condominium without a parking space or they'll have great difficulty reselling it later in the market. It doesn't need to have to be reserved, again, just associated with it. But this actually comes out to an average of 0.75 spaces per unit over the whole site, which I think is what's going to work for us. Um, the ability to build, um, you know, part, some garages bigger earlier, which is a key consideration because this only really works once it is all built out. So up front, we're challenged a little bit if we stick to those ratios. So again, a lot of it's about parking supply and being flexible in it, and that's really important. Um, supporting factors for shared parking strategy, obviously, the mixed-use development aspect is the key item. It's really hard to, to share parking without that. Um, the PTDM plant actually gives us a really great, uh, you know, I guess, plan or guide plan for how do we get to this as well. Um, and so there's a lot of things that, you know, help. Obviously, subway stations, easy ride shuttle, those are all help. Um, but the biggest challenges I want to leave you with is really for working with our lenders and investors, and they're actually the easier group. To be honest, it really is the commercial brokerage community and the commercial tenants. They are the ones that, you know, have a sense that they have a much greater need of parking than they actually do. Um, and one thing we've been working with the Stephanie is getting that data that they've already been collecting that really helps us educate them on that there are other companies that are bigger than you, have more employees than you, and only need a fraction of the parking. And so that's kind of the struggle. But um, so, okay. Thank you. And, and I want to, we want to ask a few questions here uh, of the panel and, and certainly of uh, Professor Shoup, too. I'm going to get some here. But, uh, you know, D Doug, you answered one of my immediate questions was you've got all that development and it's been financed. And, but you've got lenders who are willing to drop to these lower rates. And that's commonly something that is a misperception. The banks require four spaces per thousand. That's sort of a, a falsehood. It's a red herring that everybody uses. It's the brokerages who may be trying to say that. Um, well, again, I think it, it takes, it depends on the use, and it's, we have a much easier sell on the residential side of it today than we do on the commercial side of it. Um, but again, I think what works for us, at least with North Point, is that it is a parking district and that we can show that even though we may only build, you know, you know 0.9 spaces per, you know, 1,000 square feet of that building, the district has flexibility so that if a certain tenant suddenly needs 1.25 spaces and another one needs 0.5 spaces, we're not getting restricted between the buildings. And that's kind of the important, that there's overflow. Not that they're actually going to use it. It's just, you know, you know, lenders are looking for buffers and understand that there is sufficient parking in it. And so, um, and then we also focus on the transit and all the other things that already, you know, support the mode share, you know, split and demographic change. So, And, and I think, you know, a lot of the questions that I'm seeing here actually have a lot to do with this question about, um, parking requirements. Uh, I'm going to ask one of these, but I'm also going to ask the, the panelists if they have any other questions or input on these points. But, but here is, uh, this is a slightly different use, and I'm not sure you have one of these uh, there, Doug. We have attempted to lift required parking requirements, but big box and even fast food want more parking. Big box grocery, six per thousand square feet. Fast food routinely comes in with double the requirement. How do you fight that? These are other uses, too. I mean, I don't know if you've got a grocery in North Point, but this is a common concern in a downtown because everybody wants a grocery store. 
So uh, no, actually, this is this is really relevant. One of the changes that we're working with the city of Cambridge on is that when North Point was approved originally, um, there was no retail parking allowed, and that was uh, an immediate um, kind of kickback on the concern about big box retail coming to North Point and big surface lots happening. We're actually working with the city of Cambridge to allow 0.5 spaces per thousand square feet. I mean, our retail component is small, so that's only about 75 to 150 spaces, so it's not a big component. But we can't get a grocery store if we don't show that they can have 75 spaces. It could be in a garage, but they definitely want. So some of the bigger tenants need it. The smaller tenants, restaurants do not, as long as we work with the city of Cambridge, making sure that the metered spaces are there. And we're huge advocates, actually, of keeping metered spaces running up till 11 o'clock at night uh, because we do want it for the retailers. And um, so but that's something that we're working with them. But it, it, is, it is delicate with some of the larger ones. But... But a grocery store is probably the only one that's really more of a chain that needs something like that. Um, I have another question here. Many commercial districts are surrounded by residential neighborhoods. This may go to both uh, Cambridge and Salem and even Professor Shoup. If a community wants to consider increasing meter prices, should that be partnered with resident parking stickers in the surrounding area? And if not, how do you make nearby residents feel comfortable that their blocks won't get congested? The spillover parking question. Uh, well, I've, I've thought about that a lot. Um, that uh, I think it's a, it's a new opportunity, uh, not a problem. Uh, that, uh, of course, we have permit parking districts in any city. I mean, it's such an obvious answer, so that if, you have, uh, if you're worried about this, you can have a permit parking district. If you don't want a permit parking district, well, you obviously don't have a parking problem. You know, why should we? Why should we worry about a, a neighborhood that, that that is worried about parking spillover but doesn't want a permit district? Uh, so, but I think permit districts should be much better than the ones that we have. That uh, uh, many of them allow two hours of free parking for non-residents, which is hard to enforce. Uh, uh, but I like the the arrangements in, in some, especially college towns where. Uh, during the daytime, many of the permit uh, districts have a lot of empty spaces because the you know the, the residents have to uh, go to work to pay their mortgages, uh, and the the empty spaces are an unused resource. So some cities um, uh, sell non-resident permits to park in those spaces. Say if it's near a, uh, a commercial area, the employers or or the uh, employees can buy a uh, a block specific permit to park in the permit district. And the cities sell up to four non-resident permits per block, and only on blocks that have spaces available to sell. And they charge usually per month what the residents pay per year, and that money can go to fix sidewalks or do something else, that, or, or reduce the price that the residents pay. So it, it, it preserves the uh, opening spaces for, for the residents and for their guests, but it also provides some parking for the people who work at the grocery stores or the clothing stores or wherever. Uh, you know, people who actually serve them in the, in the restaurants they go to or the uh, grocery stores they go to, and they're regular, peop regular um, uh, parkers in their neighborhood, they're not they're not freeloaders, they're paying guests. Um, and they, they expect to have to pay for parking if they're going to park in front of somebody else's house. Uh, and if you restrict the number of, of uh, non-resident permits to say four per block, there'll never be too many. So I think that the uh, charging for parking in a commercial district, if it does create demand for a spillover, that is spillover of paying guests. And uh, it, it, it provides money to fix the sidewalks or uh, whatever the neighborhood wants, whether, uh, uh, so, so I think that it's not, a, uh, it's not an objection uh, to, uh, to putting parking meters in, in any commercial district that it will uh, harm the nearby neighborhoods because we have ways of, of, of dealing with that that will make the nearby neighborhood even better than they were without the spillover parking. Maybe uh, you you have actually have more uh, real world experience with dealing with these. So um, for the Salem comprehensive parking plan, we actually had three groups of users that we wanted to sort of meet their needs, and we've talked about the you know the customers. Rena's talked about the employees, and we also wanted to um, you know protect and serve our residential 
uh, neighbors. But we, um, staff and the administration, loved the idea that Professor Shoup just talked about that our consultant also recommended, which is to take advantage of those empty spaces on the street in the nearby adjacent residential <coughs> neighborhoods um, during the day. And the <coughs> residents would be able to park there, but they would also be um, opened up to uh, commercial parkers at a cost. I think it was a confusing um, proposal because we were never, that was um, the only key proposal that we felt we were not able to get um, traction on and move forward with. But the suggestion that I like that we actually did not try, and maybe this will be for the future, is uh, if the additional revenue could then go into that um, specific neighborhood, uh, that might help us. Well, that's I right. Think. I think permit districts are very democratic. You have to petition for them. The, the government doesn't impose them. The, the property owners ask for them. And so I think it's, it's up to the city to offer this option to a neighborhood. See, I don't see how any neighbor could be object to being offered the option of a permit district that has non-resident permits that are paying a market price for the spaces and either that'll make my permits free or it will uh, provide some public services that you want. I think you have to look at it, see what that neighborhood wants. But it would be only by petition from the neighborhood. See, it's the city's responsibility, I think, to offer that option. Uh, you can't expect residents to say, we want, this op we want you to offer this option. It's up to the city to say, this is something we offer you. And if they don't take it, that's just fine. Well, thank you. Um, and because we don't have a lot of time, we want to move on to the next sessions in a couple of minutes. But I wanted to certainly uh, thank our panelists. I think there's been some really good discussion here. Uh, thanks to Professor Shoup, Stephanie Grohl, and Duncan, uh, Renus, and Doug. Thank you very much. I think if there's one theme out of this session that not everybody's really thinking about directly, it's to be thinking comprehensively, whether it's about the development impacts and the off-street parking requirements, the on-street pricing, the residential spillover. Anything you do in your community has got to think comprehensively, not just about parking, but as its place in broader economic development, which I think is first and foremost in everybody's minds. Um, we are going to have two breakout sessions now, about no more than five minutes for coffee. People who are B are going to be upstairs. People who are A are going to stay right here. If you have other questions, I'm sorry we didn't get to answer them for Dr. Shoup, still turn them in, and well, we'll have fun. an opportunity to address them later. Thank you. Off.